Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. That is like the warmest welcome I think probably at least I've had in like a year and a half. I don't know about you. It's been a while. That was pretty warm. Yeah, exactly. Keep up the warmth. I'm, it, it, ward off this San Francisco fog. Um, I just want to say good evening and thank you for coming tonight. Um, my name is Laura Holson. I write for the New York Times and I'm also the founder of a festival called The Box Sessions, which is based on uh, principles around creativity. So this conversation tonight is very important to me because it's very much in line with my, my goals and what I believe is important. And tonight we're with Sarah Stein Greenberg and she's the executive director of the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, also known as the D School. And she's also the author of this book, Creative Acts for Curious People, How to Think, Create, and Lead in Unconventional Ways. Um, it's a field guide with 80 different exercises, right? Is that a good way to describe it? Yeah, it really is an attempt to embody the not just the ideas and the methods that we use at the D School, but also like what is the experience of learning in the way that we learn at the D School, which is highly experiential. So it's like a field guide, it's a methods book, it has a little philosophy about creativity in there. It's a, it's a mixture of things. Excellent. So we're going to just do a couple of housekeeping things, and then we're going to dive right in. And if you'd like to ask a question during the program, just write it out on a question card. Um, I think there are some around the room where they should have been on your seats. And the staff will collect them, and then they'll give them to me, and so we can read the questions on stage. And if you're watching virtually, please also ask questions. Uh, you can place them in the chat, and we'll get through them. And um, we're really interested to hear you know, what you have to say as much as well, you know what Sarah has to say. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. And we used to describe design as a production of, say, a Herman Miller chair or a Mary Mecco print, but that has changed in today's world. Um, what is design thinking, and how, is that, how has it evolved to include everything from, say, having a more productive conversation or having a better life? Yeah, I like to think that design has really expanded. It's on this kind of incredible trajectory as more and more people figure out how powerful the methods are that designers have always used. And I like to think of it as a, a very flexible problem-solving method, but it's also kind of equally about problem-finding. So, so many people are kind of very skilled problem solvers, like whether you're in business or engineering, any kind of technical field. But I think one thing that is very special in design is that we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is the problem here that we mm -hmm. could be solving for? What are the needs of the people in this ecosystem, in this situation that might be present today, but also might be um, more apparent and, and gaining in speed and, and steam in the future? Um, and, and really try to wrestle with, um, you know, how do we find those non-obvious needs, those things that are kind of, they're hidden in plain sight, they're kind of, they're about to come to the fore. So that, that balance between not just the problem solving piece, but, but what is the problem here worth solving is also a big part of how we think about design at the D School. So how do you know something is a problem or how do you know what to look for? That's the question. Yeah, right? that's a great question. And we have a whole variety of ways you might dig into that. So one you know, important method is going and just immersing yourself in the situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, literally, if you're trying to redesign a retail experience or you're trying to redesign the experience at the DMV, you would go sit at the DMV and really observe. You would go through the process of, you know, trying to renew your license and really experience what that is like. And then you would also really engage with all of the people in that ecosystem. You would talk to people who were really frustrated. You would talk to people who were really pleased with the experience. And you would talk to the people who were providing it as well. And you're trying to get that sort of un unpack that complexity that is uh, the real experience in any system and, and peel away those different layers and try to figure out, okay, where are the opportunities to improve something here? Where, where can we make this better? Where can we make this more delightful? Where can we make this more efficient? 
different based on what your lens is and what your what kind of design you're after. So, you know, I just moved here from New York. And if you want to go to the DMV and improve that experience, I'd be pretty happy if you did that. Yes. Many, many people <laughs> think of the DMV as a place where uh, we need to improve the experience. I will, I will say I had a wonderful experience recently at the DMV in San Francisco. So maybe <laughs> someone has been, you know, uh, applying some design. And actually, mm -hmm. I think it had to do with the fact that it was, a, it was lower density than normal mm. because of, of the pandemic conditions. And frankly, people were smiling and friendly and really helpful and I, I it really got me thinking about maybe there is this kind of systemic need and the pressure around the volume of transactions that are happening that are actually anchoring that system in in one that does not feel good to the to anyone who's involved that's it's an interesting idea because you often see that at the coffee shop too people seem a little bit more relaxed than they normally are yeah so, I think that's right yeah so in reading your book there was a uh, one Thing or that I read recently, or actually it wasn't in your book, it was an interview you did. And I thought this was a really interesting quote. You said, there's a lot of ambiguity about what the future is going to look like. And I think design is a way that we can prepare ourselves to be able to navigate that kind of amb ambiguity and tackle the kinds of challenges that we don't even have names for right now. So maybe in a, a couple of sentence, the sentences, can you tell us what you think those challenges are and then how will design thinking help prepare us, you know, for, to, to face those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just in the past 19 months, we've all experienced challenges that, you know, none of us were trained for, none of us could have predicted. And those are the kinds of challenges that, you know, sort of arrive when we are, we least expect them in some ways. And the challenges that then we need to rise to as individuals, as families, as communities, as, as companies. And I think that, you know, in my experience, when we see our students start to navigate the kinds of open-ended challenges that we hand them at the D-School um, and, and start to apply their creative abilities, they're, you know, often they're coming up with great creative, innovative solutions, but they're gaining something else, which is the ability to have this kind of reliable skill set to, to, you know, dive in when the answer isn't clear, when what you have to do is figure out all of these different perspectives that are competing or conflicting, when you're trying to find that signal in the noise and to, to stick with it, even if there's not an obvious way to address that problem. And those kinds of skills around being resourceful and inventive and resilient in the face of, you know, setbacks, mm -hmm. though, that is, those are some of the skills that you, at, we all need at this moment when the context is shifting rapidly rapidly and frankly, you know, throwing us challenges that we just, you know, n nobody took a class in <laughs> what we all have just experienced, right? right? I mean, people have, you know, scientists know part of it, public policy mm -hmm. makers know part of it, educators know part of it, but the the degree of um, new challenges that we faced, I think is a, is a really object lesson in why these skills around um, creativity just couldn't be more important. Can you give me an example of something your students did, like a kind of a real world where they actually solved something or something that you worked on with them? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a couple examples. One is um, we, and I, I, I give this uh, story in more detail in the book, we had a team of students who were working with a hospital in southern India. Mm -hmm. And the hospital's mission is really to provide very high quality health care at large scale and at very low cost. And that, that's a challenge in and of itself, those three things don't often uh, go together. And the students um, really observed something, you know, they went in thinking, well, we're going to work on making the system more efficient or reducing some of the cost or designing something for the administrators and the clinicians. And what they noticed when they arrived is that there were a lot of people who were waiting, waiting in the hospital, waiting in the waiting rooms, but also in the hallways and outside. And they started interviewing and engaging with these folks and realized, oh, these are the family members who are spending a lot of time without a lot of information, and they're very anxious. They don't know what's happening with their loved one. They aren't, um, they don't feel equipped to kind of know what to expect when this person uh, who's the patient returns home. 
And so the students really gravitated toward this kind of very human set of needs, which was they weren't expecting. Yeah. And what they wound up designing was a, a, an educational program to train family members while their loved ones were in surgery or, or mm -hmm. recovering. Um, and then what's amazing is that then the, the, the family members are really equipped to be the caretaker once the patient returns home. And it's, it's actually a quite low cost intervention that will um, that reduces the rate of hospital readmissions and of post-surgical complications because you're equipping the person who has the highest stake in the patient's recovery, and it's a it's a remarkable example um, of of how being open to those non-obvious needs mm -hmm. can lead you to uncover space for something really creative and really innovative. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say the the that group of students um, actually founded an organization called Nura Health, which is um, alive and well, and they have trained over a million family members across uh, across South Asia. I mean, it's really That's incredibly amazing. impactful. And that came from you know a team that didn't have pr prior experience with this particular issue. They were approaching it through this very um, uh, sort of fresh eyes perspective, and they partnered and collaborated with the nurses and the hospital staff in a way that allowed them to really you know create this incredibly impactful new solution. And do they work collabor collaboratively in a group or does someone oversee them? Because, you know, a lot of times people are afraid to try something new. Yeah. I mean, the students in that case were on a team of four. They were in a class and there was a teaching team that had, you know, helped shape the partnership with the hospital. But in, in this case, there's always room for the students to um, kind of go off road, right? To actually observe what's really happening in the ecosystem. And I think that that particular example is a good one where, you know, the teaching team, the faculty would never have predicted that that was the problem that the students would choose, would identify and choose mm -hmm. to solve. And, and the folks at the hospital wouldn't either because it was so normal in their context. And so that, that permission that we set where we actually really expect students to engage in the problem framing and identification part of it, that's often what leads to the most dramatic solutions. And one of the ways, it, and just kind of looking at your book, the way that you get people to have a, a more open mind or to try new things is to give them exercises. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we give them a lot of different assignments. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually have a pretty strong philosophy that, you know, instead of just sort of like learning the skills individually, we, we put them together in design challenges from the mm -hmm. beginning. And, and we escalate the difficulty of those. So in a given class, you're going to run through multiple cycles mm -hmm. of, a, of design work because design is this very integrative and iterative way of working. And you kind of get good at it only by being able to look back and see how this project turned out and that project turned out out. So those multiple cycles in, in, you know, which there are lots of different individual assignments um, is, is really a big part of our process. And there are different, you're looking for different outcomes, say. So for example, um, you know, you may want to, you know, as I was thinking of the, the, um, the different activities, some are for getting to know someone better. Some are for how do we problem solve? What do you think is a takeaway, or I should say, what is your favorite um, activity in the book that you found that you've gotten the most uh, response from, say, from students? Well, it's very hard for me to name my favorite activity. This was, <laughs> I felt often when I was writing this book that this was like, <laughs> these are all my favorites. They're all my babies. Um, you know, one uh, assignment. Or maybe one that has most impact. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I mean, something. yeah, that's a great question. Um, one assignment that I think can be extremely transformational for people in terms of just opening their eyes and kind of seeing the world around them in new ways is called the Derive, mm -hmm. which was contributed by um, Carissa Carter, who's our uh, director of teaching and learning. And the Derive is a kind of a, a drift that you take in a city, in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. in a mall. And you allow yourself to follow object by object or, or sense by sense. Like if you see something that's yellow and you decide to follow the color yellow, you let that be your guide. 
And what you notice along the way is that you've been kind of filtering a lot of information out. And by seeing through this very particular lens of yellow, or some people might follow a smell or a, a different sense, you're, you, you start to actually like retrain your attention. And often people who are kind of like stuck on some part of their process or their, their challenge will come back from doing a derive and they feel totally unstuck. They feel like it's almost been like a meditative experience. And a lot of, um, a, a lot of the skill of uh, noticing comes from kind of putting yourself in this almost altered state where you're paying attention in this very particular way. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing in, the, in our current moment, right? Like if you're constantly on your phone, if you're right. busy, if you're rushing. And so creating that space with this kind of unorthodox way of progressing through a particular walk can really help you see the world in a different way. You know, one of uh, one of the uh, exercises that I found kind of interesting was um, the what's in your fridge. And it made me think, what's in my fridge? But then it made me think, what's in your fridge? Are we so, going to go there? Yeah, we're going to go there. <laughs> so I texted you last night and said, send me a picture or let's talk about your refrigerator. So we're going to actually show you one of the exercises. And and maybe you can describe for everybody what the exercise is, and then sure. we can, we'll dive in. <laughs> so um, this exercise was created by uh, Leah Ramirez Siebert, um, who used to teach at the D School. And she was leading um, a project that was around tackling obesity. And she was trying to figure out, okay, I've got all of these amazing practitioners from medicine and, and other parts of healthcare. And how, do, how am I going to start off this group? A lot of people don't know each other. We got to build some bonds really quickly. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, you can do an icebreaker, but what we try to do in these kinds of warmups is like figure out how, how can we get you started already on the project that you're working on, either the creative behavior we want to see or the, or diving into the topic. So Leah came up with this idea to have everyone bring in a picture of the inside of their refrigerator <laughs> and then in the first five minutes of the workshop, share it with their, with somebody else. And, um, this allowed people to start to see, wow, what's in your refrigerator, like kind of says a lot, but what, what does it say? <laughs> so that let, maybe we can. Yeah, I think, see. um, so we both took pictures of our, uh, refrigerator and we're going to share them with you in like real time. And I'm totally embarrassed about mine, but I will give you mine first Okay, and you can tell people what you see and, uh, what does it say about me? <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, the first thing that I see is it's sparse. There's, <laughs> there is not a lot. There's a, uh, there's some sour cream on the top shelf. There's a mystery object in the top drawer. And then there's some, maybe some yogurt and some eggs. Um, I see there's a dairy theme and then there's <laughs> some, there's some butter lettuce. But I, I mean, I have to say the first thing that I notice is there is not a lot in here. So why is that? Um, because I came to San Francisco, I was going to be gone for two weeks and I didn't want to have a lot of stuff in my fridge. So I gave my sister my vegetables because I had a bunch of gorgeous vegetables. I gave her my tomatoes and the sour cream. I can tell you for a while because I just moved to um, California from New York. I was eating only quesadillas. So you, I got rid of the tortillas, but I had a little sour cream for the quesadilla. So that's cheese. That mystery is, is some cheese. And uh, the lettuce, I would put the lettuce in there too. So that was basically my diet for the past week. And I mean, when you first handed me your phone, you said, I'm really embarrassed. Why were you really embarrassed? Because I thought there should be more vegetables in there. And then I realized that I gave them all to my sister. So then it's not as embarrassing as I thought. I mean, what would it say about you if you had a lot of vegetables in there? Um, it would probably maybe signal to someone that I'm a healthy eater. Okay. Where if you have a lot of dairy, people think, why is there so much dairy? And is that, I mean, is being a healthy eater like a value that you hold? Oh, hundred percent. Okay. I mean, I actually cook a ton. You would not know that from my refrigerator. Interesting. So, so it's, it's kind of a, it's, it, it, it gives you a story, but it's a story of the moment, not a story of say a life. Yeah. Which I think is kind of interesting in, in terms of having a dialogue about with someone, um, you have to go deeper to really see them for who they are versus 
what you might on a first um, impression. I think that's right. I mean, you have, you have to kind of peel back those, those layers. And it's interesting, though, it is a part of your life that you just moved, that you're yeah. on the move, that you're, so you're really, that is, that's, it, it provides this interesting tension between your long-term values and your lived experience right in this moment. Right. Okay, cool. so let's see your refrigerator. All right, your turn. <laughs> okay, so yours is much more filled than mine. And I see um, you have lettuce, you have some apples in the bottom drawer, and you have kale, or is that, I think it might be arugula, right? Arugula, yeah. Okay, arugula, and some Parmesan cheese in the meat keeper. So makes me think that you like Italian food? Yes. Okay, and um, organic yogurt, um, Strauss milk, which is, is it cream? It is half and half. It's yeah. half and half. Okay. So you. I you... want credit for it being half and half, not okay. cream, I think. Okay. <laughs> that might be why I just had to volunteer that. <laughs> you know, it's... And um, it looks like you're a cook because I see something in a, like, what's this right here? It's some food in a. Beans. Beans. Yes. Oh, what yes. kind of beans? Um, I can't remember what kind of beans, but I fell in love with my pressure cooker during the pandemic. And so, like, they, I mean, we could talk all night just about how good that pressure <laughs> cooker is at like keeping all the flavor in beans. And watermelon, I see, and um, and another kind of melon. So, and eggs. So what this tells me about you is that you're a cook. Um, you, do you eat in stages? Like, do you, do you like have a appetizer and then have dinner? Or do you have a salad first and then a meal? Um, no, but I do really like to cook. I mean, I, you're yeah. absolutely right. And I think, you know, what, what what you can't see from that photo is that I also had this moment when you texted me, I was like, do I have time to go grocery shopping before I have to take this picture? <laughs> and I mean, I think it's interesting that we both had yeah. that reaction of mm -hmm. this, this makes me feel a little vulnerable. But partly because, you know, we're sharing this with a much broader audience than you might normally in this <laughs> you activity. You hundred people, people who, are on, on, who are watching. And, I, you know, I think like that is what the heart of the activity is about, yeah. right? Is can you evoke a little bit of vulnerability in a way that still feels kind of safe and playful? And also we're, we're equally sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody has, you know, sort of the, the upper hand in terms of this dynamic. And then, you know, if we're about to embark on a creative project together, we have like a little spark. We have a little bit of trust. We have a little bit of knowledge about your recent move about my eating preferences and your cooking and your yeah. pressure cooker and yeah exactly, like, exactly exactly and that I mean probably just the fact that I just raved about a pressure cooker it tells you a lot about me <laughs> um so there's just there's you know a little bit of bonding that just happened and that kind of trust and interaction is what you need if we're going to go on a project together on a on a challenging open-ended you know adventure where we might really make something new mm -hmm. and where you're going to have to share a hunch that you have and I'm going to come back and say like oh let me see let him not sure. And we're going to share kind of unfinished work and unfinished ideas with each other. And that part of creativity, when we practice it as kind of, as we do at the D school, kind of as a team sport, it, re it requires that kind of interpersonal trust. Um, this is what I loved about this book is I loved that it gave people activities to become uh, closer and have you know, a richer experience with each other. Because what we just did, you could do it in a business setting, but, but quite honestly, that could be like a good first date question. That's, you know? a, that's a good idea. Yeah. There's actually another assignment in the book called first date, worst date. And <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh -huh. I'll take my phone back. Thank yeah, you. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and that one is, uh, it, it's also fun. And it's, it just, it dwells in that space of like, you know, dates are times when like sometimes weird stuff comes out. Um, in that case, we have people build a representation of their first worst date in Legos, which is all about um, getting people to take a very abstract idea and build it into a physical form. But in a, again, a very playful and light way that brings out some interesting stories. Um, so that immediately my mind went there when you were talking about mm -hmm. dating. And what you're talking about too is, is interesting, I think, for this moment that we're living in. Because I think what we have, a lot of us have not had, because we've had to live isolated lives basically for a year and a half, is connection. And people are craving connection. And I think what this book does, whether you're a design, whether you're a teacher, whether you're you know, not a teacher, you're just a curious person, it gives you tools to connect. Because I think people are they're struggling with it right now. 
I think we're rusty. I mean, I think a yeah. lot is, we've kind of forgotten. And uh, there was a great piece uh, in the Washington Post uh, today or yesterday about like the importance of connecting with strangers mm -hmm. and how, how that enriches us in so many ways. And I think that you need a little, you know, sort of creative prompting. You need a little help sometimes to, mm -hmm. to bridge that gap um, we've, all, we've all experienced so acutely. I want you to talk a little bit more about that because I think people are looking for ways to connect again and the pandemic really has, um, you know, uh, it almost, it's almost like a barrier. We're just not quite sure how to do it, right? So we almost all need some kind of prompting. Yeah, I think there's, um, I, I think the principle that we, you know, use in our teaching of like starting small mm -hmm. and, and you know, reacquainting yourself, particularly with something that you're finding difficult and building that confidence piece by piece really applies here as well. Mm -hmm. So I've definitely experienced, you know, when we, at, uh, you know, all came back together as a, as a big team and did a kind of launch for this year, um, that was almost overwhelming. It was so much time with, you know, human beings in a, in a physical space that um, I think many of us hadn't been used to mm -hmm. and thinking about how you can, you know, do that, you know, sort of build back up to those kinds of social interactions piece by piece. Um, I just, I, I think that the, you know, the experience that we're having now that we are starting to be back in person mm -hmm. is very joyful, but it is also like, it's, it's also quite exhausting in many ways. Um, and I think just sort of acknowledging that and letting that come out and be part of the conversation and being real with people, mm -hmm. um, about what you're experiencing is, uh, is important right now. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. Um, you know, one thing you write about in the book and, and this is again, another, a quote that I thought was, 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 really cool. It says the journey from not knowing to knowing is every design project in a nutshell. And that sounded to me pretty Zen, <laughs> like, but then I want you to explain that to people because I think that that's a really important, you know, part of what this book is. I, I, um, heard that phrase, uh, from Richard Saul Warman, who was describing, uh, uh, Charles and Ray Eames and their, um, you know, these sort of very important American designers, and, and talking about how, you know, really it wasn't that they were able to um, sell projects based on their expertise. It was because they had insatiable curiosity. They wanted to go on a journey where they didn't, they weren't experts at first, but they would become more expert through their learning process. Mm -hmm. And this really, really got me thinking about design as a process of learning, as a process of, you know, really admitting upfront, I don't know the answer right? Maybe the answer isn't knowable and which is really relevant to the kinds of challenges that we're right. talking about. And yet I have the ability because I'm curious, because I'm creative, because I know how to, you know, talk to people and engage and, and start to get my ideas out in the world of, of crossing that, that gap between not knowing towards, and perhaps not know, you know, you don't end up knowing, but you end up knowing a lot more. And I think that was, you know, really the experience of uh, that student team, for example, mm -hmm. where they walked in and they were immediately disoriented almost by this new type of data. And they recognized like, oh, we don't actually know what's going on here. Or what's the right thing to focus on? And then piece by piece, they were able to orient and choose a direction and then come up with this very innovative solution. So that idea of design as a way to go on this journey from not knowing to knowing, I think really is, is how I think about the, the, the experience we want to design for our students and really what, you know, sort of any creative person experiences when they're, you know, starting something new and ultimately producing something, producing new work that they're putting in the world. Why do you think that people have a fear in saying that they don't know something? Is it vanity? Is it um, wanting to look like the cool kid in the room? Yeah, I think we reward expertise. I think we reward certainty. Um, I think it's it, it just it makes you feel vulnerable um, to admit that you don't know. I think one of the things that um, has been really important in terms of leadership during the pandemic in, in organizations is for leaders to say, we don't know it all. Here's what, here's what we know. Here are our values. We want to take care of our community. We want to take care of our, our people, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know how long this is going to last. And I think that, you know, when you, 
when you try to act like you know more than you know, you do a real disservice in a, in a time of great uncertainty. I would love to see more ways that people in leadership in particular can be more comfortable with saying, we don't know. But I think the other piece of that is you have to then be able to say, but we know how we're going to start to figure it out. And that is something that we hear sometimes from leaders um, who come and start to learn design with us. Um, and uh, one in particular that's coming to mind uh, was, I think, a dean of students of an East Coast college who, who really, you know, in the early stages of the pandemic, reached out and said, like, I don't know exactly how we're going to navigate the coming months, but I know how I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to I'm going to use some of those design skills that I learned, and that confidence, that sort of blend of humility and confidence, I think is is a much more authentic and real style of leadership in, in the kinds of times that we're in. What you're describing also, though, is people having structure so that if you don't, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but if you have some, I mean, tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, but if you have some kind of structure, you at least kind of can see something forward versus just having a big fog out there. Yeah. I mean, you need a mental model. You need a sense of like, what's my creative process? How am I going to guide my team? What are the conditions that we need to set that will allow us to, even when we're feeling exhausted or worried or scared about the future, that we know how to, how to show up creatively. And how would you apply that to say in a personal way? You know, because as a team, I understand you need a strong leader to guide you. But sometimes in your personal life, I mean, I know people who are just, they just, they're almost paralyzed. They don't know what to do. And so how can design help someone who's, you know, paralyzed m be able to move forward? I mean, I, I think that there's um, a couple of practices. Mm -hmm. So one, I think it is really important to just recognize those feelings and not try to squelch them. And, you know, emotions are part of any kind of creative work. There are highs and there are lows. And so if you're feeling stuck and you're feeling paralyzed, naming that as the first thing to work on, I think is really important. You can't reach for a big ambitious solution if you're feeling, if you're feeling really stuck. I think the, some of the assignments that are in the book that are much more about that personal creativity, um, whether it's direct your curiosity or the derive, which we talked about, the, the ability to look inward and recall, remember, and get back in touch with that like individual creative spark is really important. Um, I find being in community to be a part of that for me personally, mm -hmm. that when I'm, when I'm feeling like I need that, um, I, I need some of, I need to like sort of sponge off of someone else's energy. I want to connect with someone else who may be at a different stage in their cycle of ups and downs. Um, I, I think that that is something I have learned over time is that that connection helps for other people. It might be disconnecting. It might be spending yeah. time alone and for me, what's important is that self-awareness, is having had time to reflect on my own creative process, what I need when I'm feeling stuck or, or when you know I feel like I might be languishing, which is kind of the, the topic of the day. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of um, ways to, to get going. And for me, connecting with others is always a part of that. You know, one thing you talk a lot about in the book as well that I found really interesting was this idea of, of empathy. Um, and you talk about the three different facets of empathy and why we should develop them. So maybe you could talk me through them. I mean, there's experience sharing. I'll prompt you. I won't, I won't tell the other two. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, there, it, it's very interesting because empathy, I think we sort of have a, um, a kind of a popular version, which is this idea of like feeling what you feel, right. Kind of w walking in your shoes. And that's a part of it. That's experience sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are also, um, two other pieces. And one of them is called perspective taking, which is like, can I understand your mental model about something? So now I just learned from you from the picture in your fridge that you have a sense of being a healthy eater, that you have a sense that like vegetables are very connected to that. And that is kind of like, I'm a little bit sharing your mental model for he what healthy eater might mean. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is actually uh, something called pro-social motivation, which was that description was new to me as I was doing the yeah. research for this book. And it means that if I understand your needs, I um, am more likely to really want to help you mm -hmm. to actually have a, a sense of urgency about that. And I will say that in the early stages, um, you know, of the pandemic, I saw that happen for our students when they connected with people that they might be designing for, when they kind of got out of their Im 
immediate um, bubble and even even connecting online, they were able to see, oh, these needs exist in the world. Maybe I can do something about that. And it's it's interesting to think about empathy as including all three of those aspects. Um, it fuels, I think, a lot of creativity when you actually feel for someone else and you feel like you understand like what might be possible if, if something could be designed that would, whether it's help them at the DMV or help them in their, um, help them in some other part of their life. Well, aren't there studies that show that people get greater a greater sense of happiness and sense of self if they're helping someone else than if they're just doing something just solely for themselves. I think that's right. And I think, yeah. you know, for me, like design is, is almost always about designing something for others, right? It's really being of service. And I, that's certainly, um, you know, a value that we, that we try to instill at the D school. Um, I want to remind people, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down and we're going to start questions probably in about 10 minutes or so. Um, you know, as we get through a couple more things, um, how can we use empathy to be more creative? So I think that, um, you know, as I said, when you, when you get a sense of someone else's needs, it propels you. It really tries, you know, it starts to drive you. It also is just part of exposing yourself to the way that other people think and see the world. And, you know, it's like if you only stay within your own head and never, you know, think about like, oh, what does Laura need? What does so-and-so need? Then I'm really limited in terms of the universe of ideas, of opportunities, of solutions that I might come up with. So having that ability to kind of get outside of yourself and engage with others and develop empathy um, is, is, I think, a part of fueling your own creative abilities. I also think empathy with the other people you might be working with is incredibly important because as we're, as we're talking about, you know, you have highs and lows in any kind of challenging work and you need to be able to kind of show up for a team member who might be struggling at a moment. So I think it can be, you know, if you have a team and that team does not have empathy for each other, they will get stuck in some of the moments of, of design work that often, you know, create some tension, create some, some challenges. Can you, um, I, I don't know if this is possible, but can you design empathy into a into a situation? Because I'm just thinking of that situation when people are stuck, how do they get unstuck if they don't if they really can't understand the needs of their colleagues, how, what, how do they get unstuck? I mean, one thing I've seen over and over is that students will often, um, uh, when they are having a moment of team conflict, they think that they, what they should do is work harder on the problem or the project. And that is almost always the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. What they actually need to do in that moment is pause and say, something about this dynamic is not working here. I'm stuck, you're stuck, you seem stuck, like what, what is going on? And, and really name that and then create the space to have that kind of hash it out. And that, uh, that you know, ability to pause in the moment and let that be a part of the work, it's not getting in the way of the work. In fact, if you don't attend to those moments, you will, you will be getting in the way of actually uh, getting the work done. So we sometimes do design in those moments for teams to check mm -hmm. in, to troubleshoot, to try to fix you know, issues before they, before they occur. And then I'll also just say like the, you know, those, those practices around, um, you know, creating uh, short timeframes, uh, mm -hmm. allowing people to have a shared vocabulary where we're all in the process of exploring this new idea together versus we're all in the process of deciding on which idea we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. That, that shared um, understanding of kind of where you are in your process, that also helps reduce some of those moments of conflict that can arise. Um, it's interesting because I, I was just thinking, I, I don't know what your experience has been during the pandemic, but I, I moved just from New York and in our building, um, half of our, half the, you know, the building left and it was just like four of us, four different buildings, you know, because there were like eight, eight um, apartments and so four of us stayed and we became so much more collaborative, you know, like I would bake and so I would leave little things on people's doors and then the guy, you know, in 2A would bring up boxes to my you know, to my door. It was kind of an interesting, you know, ex you know, almost an experiment, if you will, in collaboration. And I don't know if we designed it that way, but it ended up being that way. Maybe it started with me, like leaving people, you know, bit home baked bread, bread on their doors, because all the bakeries were gone in the neighborhood. They just closed down. So it's kind of interesting how you can, just with a simple act in what you're talking about, yeah. kind of bring people into solve a problem, which yeah. is we all needed help in this. Had anyone in your building like given those kinds of gifts or baked for each other before? 
Um, no. See, that's what was yeah. so interesting. So you broke that barrier. You yeah. did. You created something handmade, personal, yeah. hand delivered, and and then it sounds like people kind of built on that. Yeah, and we became a team. Actually. Yeah, you became a team. I mean, that's very like that is a great sort of um, analogy to what we see happening in a productive team that's kind of taking care of each other. Yeah. Where then you kind of you build on those ideas and you get to that momentum that kind of propels a team through through a real challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm correct on this, a lot of your colleagues, um, you know, contributed to this book and I think probably some of them are here tonight, right? Yes. That might account partly for the warm welcome we had at the very beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to point out, I, there's a whole row of D schoolers, uh, sitting right over there and this yay. book is yes. Yay. yay first of all. <laughs> Um, this book is really, um, a, uh, incredible collection of ideas and methods and approaches from the past 15 years that the D school has been around and, you know, the kind of the brilliance and care that each and every person who teaches at the D school takes in constructing these assignments. I hope it really comes out in this book. And I think as a result, there's really something for everyone. Like there's very different teaching styles that we all have in terms of like leading with heart, leading mm -hmm. with, um, you know, like people who really specialize in how do you build things in any kind of different medium. And that is what makes it, I think, such a, a useful compendium is because it has so many different perspectives that are baked in. I love that you just said leading with heart because so much of leading as we hear about it is leading with the head, right? It's like thinking your way through the problem, not necessarily feeling your way through a problem. Can you talk a little bit about that, the tension of that and why both are necessary? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of us are kind of trained more in that cerebral um, or an analytical way of looking at problems. Um, but there's a whole, uh, there's a whole set of research um, around the other ways that you can learn about the world, that you can express ideas. And that's much more about feeling and also trying things out. So the kind of feeling and doing side of the equation is often um, much more, it's underdeveloped in a, in a lot of us. Um, and that is really the opposite of what we do at the D school. We emphasize the feeling and the doing, right? Like we'll throw you right into the deep end, have you, you know, try to do a design project even before you think that you know what that really means. And that's not, doesn't mean you're going to produce the most amazing thing the first time through, but it's about experiencing these kinds of skills when you're, when you're trying to understand them. And then you reflect, then you actually go into the more mm -hmm. cerebral um, part of the work and you start to understand and so much of education is really built around just the sort of understanding muscle. You get you sort of unbalanced. Yeah. So the, the reality is that in a world where, you know, maybe there's some data out there about the problem you're trying to solve, maybe there's not, there, you, you have to have a blend of being able to observe, think and reflect, but also try some small experiment test your idea and actually generate new data because you're you're trying to get a response from some system, from some individual who can give you feedback. And feeling your way forward in that kind of iterative process is often how you come, you know, come out with something that really is, it meets the needs at the moment. Um, it doesn't assume that you have all of the answers when you're going into it. And I, I'll say, I, I often wind up telling my students, like, if you have an idea for what the solution is at the beginning of our project, it is very unlikely to be innovative, right? If you can yeah. see kind of straight through to the end, you're missing all of those opportunities to actually be, have your mind be opened by new information, by that interview, by actually gaining empathy for some part of the situation. And so remaining open to the unexpected, which is a intuitive, more feeling oriented way of understanding and engaging with the world. Mm -hmm. That is a key part of design work. Well, it's not going just for the obvious. It's kind of, I mean, I think of as, as in writing. And I'm actually, I'm curious about how you managed to write with all of the people you, you were wrote with. Because as a writer myself, it, writing is, can be very solitary. And it can be challenging at times if it's very collaborative. Can you, can you maybe talk a little bit about that in terms of creating this book? How you can make it collaborative so everybody's voice is heard? I mean, I think that was your, probably your biggest design challenge was in getting this, this 
book, you know, done. Yeah. I mean, it was a really, uh, really fascinating process. So we started, I mean, we used a lot of our own design approaches. So we started by interviewing everybody in the, in the teaching community. Uh, we interviewed it over a hundred people and actually, you know, when you asked me for my favorite mm -hmm. assignment, that was one of the questions that I led with, right? I didn't want sort of the kind of the obvious, I wanted the, like, what's your favorite? What's the one that you just poured your heart into? Mm -hmm. What's the one that you've seen the, you know, the biggest student transformation from? And and so we collected all these stories and examples and then um, went through a process of kind of figuring out like, okay, how do we, how do we curate those so that they are, um, they, they'll make sense to you and be impactful for a reader. And actually there was a moment where I had the entire book mapped out in my hallway on different color pieces of paper, amazing. trying to figure out, you know, it's like, okay, well, if we put all of these over here, it's going to be way too, in, you know, like sort of overwhelming at the beginning. How do we spread those out? And I, I am a very visual thinker. And so being able to have those sort of bits and pieces to move around was really helpful for me. But then the other important part was that I went back to all of the contributors and asked them to read an early draft of their what they had contributed. Mm -hmm. And I got really important feedback in that stage. And that was, you know, again, I felt pretty vulnerable because I was taking, you know, their contribution. I was adapting it and changing it and trying to make it fit in a book format, which is mm -hmm. different from how we how we teach in, um, you know, in person. And, um, you know, I got some like wonderful, like, this is great. I love it. Keep going. And also some people were like, oh, I think you really missed the, missed the mark here. And, and that's, you know, that kind of, um, uh, moment where you, it's that there's a little sting, right. When you get <laughs> feedback, that's like not exactly what you wanted to hear. And then, it, and then the work gets so much better as a result. And that's exactly how we try to, you know, get our students to approach their work, which is you don't have to have the right answer the first time, but you need to be open to hearing other people's ideas that can improve it. And so it, it was that iterative process that kind of, that led to what you see today. Well, I think that's a really good point because it's very, you know, as someone who writes myself, you know, when your editor shows up and they say, this is really great, except for this 15 things. And you're just like, <gasps> you just breathe in a little bit. And then you're like, okay, it's not that bad. Like just do the work because the truth is you want people to read you read it. And so if, if somebody else has a different idea about how to say something or present something that's more, you know, uh, approachable for people. Yeah. Um, I mean, you need to hear it. You want to hear yeah. it before the book is published, not exactly. after the book is published. And, you know, my editor was kind of the, the stand in the champion for the reader who has never been to the D school, who has no idea, you know, doesn't have a background in design, maybe feels a little intimidated by some of these, these topics. And so she really would spot those moments where I wasn't being clear enough or I was, you know, it was like too much in the context of, uh, you know, how to do it in a team. Mm -hmm. And, and one thing she pointed out that was so helpful was like, Hey, most people are going to read this on their own. So even if they are part of a team or a community where they, that, where they want to activate, uh, folks to be more creative, to use some of these approaches, that initial moment of taking in this information will be a personal one. So can we, con you know, it's like constantly striving to connect with kind of really where people are at. It was so helpful to have that back and forth, even though there were moments where I was like, oh, I wanted it to be right the first time. That's my, <laughs> you know, co problem I'm trying to work on. <laughs> no, I mean, it also, I think with uh, looking at the different exercises, it's great to think of them as a team, but I think, uh, you know, people want permission these days to get out of their comfort zone. And a lot of these, you know, the activities you're having here, they can be done, you know, with you or your partner or a group of friends. Um, it, you know, and, and that's, that's awesome, right? Because then it works at the office, it works at home. It's a more holistic approach. You know? Yeah, that's right. There's one in the book, um, uh, which is a, about practicing metaphors yeah. and it's actually, it's called, uh, uh, tell your granddad. And the idea is that you're trying to come up with metaphors, which are such a powerful tool for doing all kinds of things in design, but you're doing it in a very playful sort of competition way. Mm -hmm. That would be a great thing to do at a dinner party or like <laughs> on a family, you know, vacation. I mean, there are so many, uh, assignments in here that could have multiple uses like that. Well, if we're all getting back together for Thanksgiving and Christmas, I think people have got some homework to do. So um, one thing I, I, I was really intrigued in reading the book, um, you talked about daydreaming and, you know, imagination insomnia, which I think you described as people being maybe unable to locate the creative mindset. Um, daydreams, lost, we have our faces in our phones. Um, what can we do to get back to a place that daydreaming becomes a part of our normal routine? 
Well, there is an assignment in the book called these micro mindfulness challenges, which is all about how do you how do you find that space in your in your brain again for your imagination, um, and that was contributed by Leticia Britos Cavanaro, who's mm -hmm. uh, here in the audience tonight, and um, a number of her colleagues. And there are kind of a structured set of exercises in that particular assignment, and the first one is about um, walking around while smiling, and just noticing what that does to your interactions with others and how that feels in your body and how that feels when you see yourself in a reflection and notice that you're mm -hmm. smiling. And there's another um, layer, maybe you do that the next day, that's about um, pausing when you uh, enter a new space, when you walk through a doorway and being mindful of that, of that doorway. And there's a few others. And those are all about like, you don't have to make new time to be more intentional and to try to create that space in your brain that's a little bit of downtime or a little bit of focus. And I think those are very approachable ways to try to sort of build that, that rhythm back. And I mean, it's really a challenge if we are, if you're, head is in your phone all of the time, you are taking up every moment that you have to be engaged. And it's actually incredibly important just to reset and to reflect and to think and to imagine and to dream. And so I, I love that um, particular assignment. And um, you could do that over, you know, the different days of a week, you could do that all together. Um, but it's about kind of restoring that practice for yourself of, of allowing yourself to daydream. So we have some really interesting questions. So I'm just going to kind of dive into that if that works for you. So um, someone, I think in the audience, um, said, could Sarah please speak to her background, your path to a role at the D school? Were there, mentored who fought, or were there mentors who fostered or people who stymied your creativity? That's a great question. Um, well, we don't have all night, so I'll give the short version. Um, I'd say the, the foundations um, of, I think, probably how I ended up uh, working in both education and in particularly around design and creativity um, have to do with the house in which I was raised. So mm. um, it was a it was a no TV slash like very limited TV kind of house. Um, and we there were a lot of tools and Legos and blocks and um, arts and craft supplies. And like really, we just, you know, a lot of time spent sort of occupying oneself, making things and, um, being imaginative. And I think that just, I mean, that sort of spoke to something in me as a person and, and, um, I probably you know, carry that forward today. Um, but then I, I also happened to be, um, a graduate student at Stanford when the mm -hmm. D school got started. And I really, I, I took some of the very early classes and I resonated immediately with this group of people in part because there, there was so much interest and fascination with these dynamics in groups around creativity that are kind of invisible. But once you name them and notice them around how to collaborate better, around how to um, defer judgment or separate the process of coming up with ideas from the process of judging ideas. And I just, I felt like this, all these things were clicking into place mm -hmm. for me. Um, and then I went and spent some time um, working as a design and innovation consultant and got to work on lots of different projects and really kind of stretch my skills in, in all different ways. Um, and then arrived back um, at the D school a little over a decade ago. Um, that's quite a journey. You had your own journey. Um, someone from YouTube asked this question. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, what should I do when the pandemic and other depressing world matters give me creativity fatigue? I think that's a real thing. And we were yeah. talking about, you know, uh, languishing before. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, uh, you know, again, finding that thing, just that one thing that you want to start working on that's small, that's in your immediate environment is, is a way to go. I also think it's fine to take a break, <laughs> right? I, I think there's sort of, you know, and there were some, you know, kind of funny critiques of the, like the people who, you know, spent time during the pandemic to like learn another language or develop this whole new skill. I, I don't think you have to be on all the time. So if you're, if you want to detach, then I think some of those assignments like the micro mindfulness exercises are the ways to go. But I'm just such a fan of start small. So it's like, 
okay, you know, maybe you've just started commuting again and that's like a whole new stressor in your life. Can you think about how you might redesign that? Can you think about Mm -hmm. what's the preparation that you might do? Maybe it's, you know, preparing that amazing lunch for yourself that's the kind of reward at the end. Or maybe that's like finding a way to carpool with someone who's, you know, in in a pod with you. So you get a little bit of that social time back. But I think just some of those like small local challenges that also deserve some creative action can be a way to sort of replenish that that muscle. I, this is pure prurient curiosity, but did you have like a, a um, pandemic like TV series you watched? I mean, all of them. Is that an okay answer? <laughs> oh, that's totally okay. <laughs> I did. I got into, um, there's a there's a long running British TV show called Grand Designs oh. and I'd never heard of it before, but it's basically, it's it's the host is a archi- uh, like architectural preservation guy. And the whole premise of the show is that a couple builds their own home Mm -hmm. and it takes longer than they expect and they go (laughs) over budget. Like that's the whole arc of the show, every episode. (laughs) And I was like, this is the predictability in a world of uncertainty (laughs) that I need right now. Um, And of course, you know, you get to see people design these very imaginative homes. Um, So that was, yeah, that was my, that was my outlet. I was curious about that. Um, so again, from a question from YouTube, um, can we design confidence into our lives? Mm. How do we do that? Great question. Yeah, I mean, we we think about um, this a lot at the D School, and one of the things that um, I think really helps is this idea of what's called guided mastery, um, which comes from psychology, and it's the idea that it's very hard if you are are trying to stretch way beyond your comfort zone to get there right away. That's where you feel like the least confident. And often if you have an experience of trying to do something, like let's take public speaking, for example. A lot of people that is are very unconfident about public speaking. If the first time you do public speaking, like you're on a huge stage and you're giving a talk, you know, and the stakes are really high, it's very hard to kind of cross that, you know, to cross that chasm. So what we try to do is to figure out, well, how do you Uh, create small experiences that you can master to build your confidence. So maybe you, you give a toast at a small dinner party and that's your, you know, the first thing that you do. And then maybe you stretch yourself and you, you know, give a presentation at work or you maybe just, you give, you know, one slide of someone else's presentation Mm -hmm. And and you think about how do you, how do you actually start to build towards the thing that is really the challenge that you want to, that you want to achieve. So I do think confidence is something that you can design for if you if you try to build on those small successes because if you think i have to do a whole presentation it may be so overwhelming that you just shut down yeah and you just don't do anything well and also you're very unlikely to be good at it the first time <laughs> so there's i mean there's a re- there's a reason to be you know it's like <laughs> the first time anyone does anything it's you know you're not usually particularly good at it. So there's, um, there's another framework that I'll share that I find really helpful, which is called the zone of proximal development, Mm -hmm. which is a little, a little, um, wonky, but it is, uh, it's an idea that has been around for a really long time. And it's the idea, um, that if you are stretching just a little bit, your abilities, like just to try to do a little bit more than what you could do yesterday, Mm -hmm. that's the right like zone for learning, right? It's just adjacent to where you are today. And if you stretch way beyond that, you actually are kind of unlikely to be successful. So what can you do that's just a little bit in that zone that's just beyond where you are today? And I find that to be a very helpful um, helpful thing to think about. Um, that's a really good, that's good advice because for anything in, in life. So um, thank you for that. Um, so another um, question from someone who's watching online. Do you believe there are pe- that do you believe there are people less curious by nature or is curiosity and creativity a muscle that needs to be developed and flexed? I believe the latter. I think that being curious and being creative are like part of the human condition and you can see this when you watch kids like they are learning about the world at an astonishing rate mm-hmm. by testing and trying and dropping the block and like, oh, that's gravity, right? And and really trying to get a response from the environment that they're in. I do think that a lot of us, you know, if you go through an educational system that's, you know, particularly rigid or prescriptive, if you're in a job that you are either, you know, it's, it's not a great fit for you or you're bored or you're overworked, I think that those kinds of things can really dull your sense of your own curiosity and creativity. Um, so I do think that, you know, you, you, 
may observe people who seem to exude less of those qualities, but I don't think that that means that they don't have them. I think that there's some block, there's some reason that they're, they're not able to fully access that at the moment. Yeah, there's um, uh, a, a professor who I've been talking to uh, lately about awe and the idea of, of how do we bring more awe into our lives? And he, you know, was kind of talking about how everybody's taking walks now, you know, everybody's out and about. And there's this idea, and it's not a, a new idea, but it's, I thought it was an interesting idea for this time, the idea of the awe walk, right? And to get out and to allow yourself to be surprised by something, because then, you know, it leads to what's the next surprise. So that's looking for, for beauty or for you know, your, your uh, example of the yellow, looking for the yellow becomes something that just becomes second nature to you if you yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. If someone gave me, um, passed along a piece of advice that they'd received very early in the pandemic about, um, going to, I mean, in our case, we are, we live on the coast so we can go see the ocean, mm -hmm. but really like anything that is kind of bigger or longer lasting or more permanent than our current sort of human concerns at the moment can help connect you to that sense of awe and to that sense of that, sort of the, the greater environment, looking up at the stars. I mean, you can, you can really access that from just about anywhere. I think that's, I think that's incredibly important. It's like, mm -hmm. you want to feel that sense of wonder at times you want to, that is a, also a, a stimulus for creativity. And can you, um, how do you bring wonder? Let's say you're at work. How do you bring wonder into your team? Well, I, I think about this a lot. Um, particularly when we've been distributed, when we've all been working from home, because we get so much from each other that has to do with like those serendipitous moments when you walk by someone and you get surprised or you like peek over someone's shoulder and see what they're, what they're, um, working on. And, um, we've found some ways to do it that involve like some like randomness, right. Mm -hmm. Where you can kind of replicate that sort of walking down the hallway experience, you know, just by using like breakout rooms in zoom that are randomly, mm -hmm. um, connected and then, and then using some prompts ourselves that are about telling stories about getting personal. Um, we had a great, uh, session the other day where just to start a staff meeting, um, someone came up with a prompt about, um, thinking about a teacher who had really influenced you and like, really amazing stories came out of that. And it was a little bit of a peek into people's, you know, personal experiences with education, which is really useful to know about because we're in education. Um, but also just that sense of, you know, like the, the depth and the, and the richness of human experience that's all around us that we're not always paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a bunch of people that, that functioned as that, like, you know, that was a, some wonder and some awe in that, in that conversation. Um, uh, someone in the audience asked um, or said, often people think creativity is innate rather than learned or taught. What do you think of that? I, I think, you know, that's similar to the conversation yeah. about curiosity. I mean, I really think that is a myth that we have in our society that we need to break down mm -hmm. because I think that that um, stops a lot of people from practicing kind of the everyday creativity that we all can be doing and perhaps, you know, sort of inhibits folks from going into a career or going into a space where they can, you know, really focus on that. So I'd love to, I'd love to see that myth go away. Um, and another person asked another, this is a really good question too. Um, were there, are there design approaches to COVID? I'd imagine this is their writing, uh, their words, not mine. I'd imagine there are many um, facets of the pandemic design could provide solutions for. Yeah, I mean, I'll give an example of a project that we worked on um, last year around the 2020 election, mm -hmm. because this was a moment where we were going to have this very important national election. And all of a sudden, it was not safe to mm -hmm. go places in person and be in crowded spaces with other people. So we worked with a whole network of folks on figuring out how can we make the polling, the in-person voting experience safe and healthy in this particular moment. And um, actually, I mean, a lot of the solutions and the innovations were coming from elections administrators all over the country, but they had no way to find out what was going on. And so one of the things that our team did was simply research and collect all of these great ideas and, and pieces of inspiration from how people, you know, in very rural jurisdictions or in big cities were figuring out how to completely redesign their polling places. And then just by making that information more visual and more accessible, we were able to help a lot of people kind of 
then exercise their own creativity and figure out how to adapt all of those solutions locally, which is actually a really important principle of how our electoral system works. It's very locally driven. Mm -hmm. So that's just one concrete example of where we found this very particular need. Um, and I will say that that's, a, that's an important part of design work as well, is that you know, you're, there's like a huge, you know, tackling COVID, that is a, that's the, too big to think about all at once. So thinking about how could we tackle that in, in, you know, in the voting system? How could we tackle that around education? How can we find these very particular scoped opportunities where um, design could play a role is often what we're, what we're doing to kind of set, set up a project for success. You know, you talk a lot about your students. And someone uh, wants to know, what have your students taught you? Oh, what a good question. Um, I think one thing that I'm really encouraged by is that, um, you know, our students really want to make a difference. They really want to make an impact and they don't want to wait until after they graduate. Mm -hmm. And they, and often, you know, they come in, uh, you know, with this extraordinary literacy about the digital world, for example, that I don't completely share. And um, they have ideas or they've already had experiences of starting companies or organizations. They've had, you know, experiences of um, having a platform, having a voice in the world. And, um, I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by their sort of sense of their opportunity for large scale impact at an age when I definitely did not have that, have that sense of myself. So I think I've, I've learned a lot about sort of like possibility and your, your sort of worldview and your aperture can help lead to where you, where you end up. Yeah, there's definitely, I, I noticed with yeah, younger generations, even those I work with, they have much more agency, you know, to kind of move forward instead of like, they don't wait. They, they don't wait. They just don't wait at all. Um, someone asked, asked a question for me, and thank you for that, because this is really all about Sarah today. Um, but they asked, um, what did I find most surprising about the book? And the thing that I think I found most helpful is that, I mean, I find with a lot of people, they have a hard time connecting. They don't always really know how to do it. And this book gave a lot of, of, you know, really easy ways to, you know, let's look at pictures of our refrigerator to kind of connect and learn something about someone. Because if we have empathy, as, as you, you know, have so aptly discussed in the book, if we have empathy for others, then we get, it's easier to solve problems. It's easier to, you know, be, um, you know, kind of unified in one. Um, so we got through all of our questions. So thank you very much to everybody who, who, you know, gave, gave one, they were really, really thoughtful and, um, we're kind of at the end here and I just want to thank you so much, but I have, a, have one question for you and what is your 60 second idea to change the world? More patience. I think that we are so impatient these days for answers and solutions and our packages to arrive and the thing to be right where we expect it to be right when we want it. And, um, you know, people to be right where we want them to be when we want them to be there. And I think there's something like kind of skewed about our expectations for, for like the timing and when things will happen at patience, I think is related to that space to daydream and to imagine. So that is my, that is my 60 second idea. I want more patience in the world. I, I second that. I agree with you on that. And, um, so this is kind of concludes our, our program tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thank all of you so much for being here. Sarah's going to be signing books, um, you know, right now. So if you have a book and you'd like her to sign it, she will. And, you know, if you'd like to watch more programs um, su or support the Commonwealth Club's effort to make more programming um, possible, um, please visit the commonwealthclub.org slash online. And they can guide you from there. I'm Laura Holson. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you again. Sarah. Thank you so much.